and um, uh, it's uh, anyway just a privilege to be able to present and share with you today. Now, uh, what I'm going to be sharing today is uh, what it means to be a Seventh-day Adventist, what it means to be a Seventh-day Adventist, and um, we're going to be covering a lot uh, in this session today. And so as we cover this, I'm going to encourage you to go share with those uh, who uh, were not here or who did not hear it, go tell them what you heard. So let's go ahead and begin with, a, with another word of prayer very quickly, and then we will get right into this. Uh, Heavenly Father, we want to ask that you would bless us as we um, open your word, Lord. Please speak to us, bring conviction. This we pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right, uh, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verses 1 through 11, uh, the Bible there records the history of Old Testament Israel. And it concludes uh, in verse 11 with uh, the words uh, which basically tell us that these things were written for what? our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11. Now all these things happened unto them for in samples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Um, this lets us know that the history of Old Testament Israel uh, was written on our behalf. Now, I want to demonstrate that to you today and just kind of set the foundation again for what we're going to be talking about. Um, let's look at the seven churches of the book of Revelation. Now, how many of you know what those seven churches are? The churches are Ephesus, and, that, and then Smyrna, and then uh, Pergamos, and then Thyatira. Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. Now, let me give you just a very brief explanation of those churches. Now, uh, uh, the church of Ephesus was the first church, represents the, uh, the early church period, um, after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Um, that church was the church that lost its first love, lost its first love. The second church is the church of Smyrna. And that was the period of persecution uh, around 100 AD and onward. That is the Smyrna church, the church of persecution. So the first church was the beginning of the movement, and that church lost its first love. And then you have Smyrna, which is the persecuted church. And after Smyrna, you have Pergamos, which is a church that compromised. Per Pergamos is the, represents a church period that compromised, and we think of a man by the name of Constantine um, who basically joined church and state together. In that period of time, the church rejected their high priest, Jesus Christ, for a king, for the protection of a king named Constantine. The fourth church is the church of Thyatira, and that is a church in which we find that woman called Mystery Babylon, mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Um, Mystery Babylon is persecuting the people of God. The fifth church is the church of Sardis. It, the, the word Sardis means those escaping, and the Sardis church uh, uh, represents the Reformation period. The Sardis church starts the Reformation However, it is not until the Philadelphia church comes on the scene which completes the Reformation. Now, who knows what the Philadelphia church represents? The Philadelphia church is going to represent... The church of brotherly love, and it's pointing us specifically to the early Advent move, excuse me, movement the early Advent movement. And ultimately, Philadelphia turns into what? Laodicea, the people of the judgment, a lukewarm people. So just to recap, the early church lost their first love. The second church 
persecution, the third church compromised, the fourth church, mystery Babylon, the fifth church, uh, the beginning of the Reformation, the sixth church, the, the, the completion of the Reformation, and then the seventh church, the people of the judgment. Now, why is that important to understand? When we think of Adam, we think of the beginning of humanity in the Old Testament. Is that correct? Yeah. Did Adam start the movement of the people of God? Yes. Did Adam lose his first love? Yeah. So the book of Genesis, in a sense, captures the very same thing as the church of Ephesus in the book of Revelation. Are you with me so far? Okay. The second church was the church of what? Come on, church of Smyrna, which is the persecuted church. Let me ask you a question. Do you find persecution happening in the book of Exodus? Do you find the children of Israel being persecuted? Are they the persecuted church in the book of Exodus? Very good. Now, what church comes after Smyrna? Pergamos. The church of compromise. Now, you remember that after the children of Israel escaped their persecution, we have the book of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, uh, and then we get to the book of jo uh, jo um, uh, Joshua, we get to the book of Judges, and something interesting happens by the time we get to the book of 1 Samuel, and that is that the children of Israel have rejected their priest, Samuel, because they want a king. Are you guys catching this? And, and in doing so, they basically bring in a king who, in a sense, usurps the authority of the priesthood. Do we find compromise happening? What church comes after Pergamos? Thyatira. And you remember that Thyatira is the church which, uh, which most closely aligns with that woman called Mystery Babylon. So here's a question. What happened as a result of the children of Israel rejecting their priest for a king? What ultimately happens to Israel in the book of 1st and 2nd Kings and 1st and 2nd Chronicles? What happens to them? Do they end up going into captivity to a power by the name of Babylon? Are you guys catching what's going on here? The history of the churches appear to be reflecting the history of the Old Testament. But there's more. Watch this. What church comes after, after Thyatira? The church of Sardis. And in the church of Sardis, here's what you have happening. Remember we said that Sardis was the beginning of the Reformation. A people leaving Babylon to begin rebuilding what had been broken down by Mystery Babylon. Are you guys following this? What happens after 1st and 2nd Kings and 1st and 2nd Chronicles? Do we have a movement beginning by a man named Ezra who is going to lead the children of Israel out of their captivity in a sense after they are set free to go back to Jerusalem to begin a work of reformation? Are you with me so far? Let me ask you, did Ezra complete the reformation? No, it was not until who came along? Nehemiah, check this out, guys. <laughs> Nehemiah <coughs> completes the Reformation, including repairing the breach. Do you see the parallel between the Church of Philadelphia or, or the, 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 the movement of, of, ne of Nehemiah finishing the work and the rise of the Advent movement. Now, watch this. After Nehemiah uh, uh, finishes the rebuilding, all the children of Israel are doing now is they are waiting for the coming of Jesus. Y'all not feeling me bad. <laughs> Do you catch this? They're just waiting for the coming of Jesus. When Jesus comes the first time, what condition are they in? Would you say lukewarm? <laughs> How many of you say they were in a lukewarm condition and were unprepared for the coming of Jesus? Beloved, do you see what we just saw? <laughs> wow. 
In other words, beloved, we run the risk, the same risk of being in the same position that ancient Israel was. And God is trying to warn us not to make that same mistake. Because there is no recovery from that same mistake. Are you with me so far? Okay. So, so far we realize, okay, we as the Advent people run the danger of being unprepared for the coming of Christ. Being unprepared for Christ's return. And the question is, why? Why? And to answer that question, I'm going to give you another scenario. We're going to go back to the book of Genesis, and this time we're going to stay there for a little while. So in the book of Genesis, here's what we have happening. In Genesis chapters 1 and 2, you have the creation account, yes? Uh, and after the creation account, you have chapters 3 through 11, which describe the introduction of sin and the fall of man. Are you with me so far? And then we have Abraham coming upon the scene, and, and uh, that's from Genesis chapter 12 uh, up to about chapters 20. And, and Abraham, uh, uh, the, the story of Abraham really describes how God was about to bring a nation upon the scene. Abraham is the father of Israel. And Abraham has promised a great seed, a seed that will multiply and fill the whole earth. So I'll just pause for a second. I want you to think about this. From Genesis chapter 1 all the way to Genesis chapter 20, you have in a shadow form the entire history of the Old Testament. Did you catch that just now? Creation, the introduction of sin and its results and then the rise of the nation of Israel and how God multiplies them. Are you with me? So that's Adam, Noah, and Abraham. Those three people basically foreshadow the entire history of the Old Testament from Genesis all the way to Malachi. Who comes after Abraham? Isaac. Isaac. Come on, guys. Isaac. You remember the one that Abraham takes up to Mount Moriah to what? To sacrifice. Who is Isaac a type of? He's a type of Christ. So watch this then. From, from Adam all the way to Isaac, what you have is in, in, in a shadow form the entire history of the Old Testament up to Jesus Christ himself in the New Testament. The New Testament Isaac, if you will. Now, after Isaac, who do we have? Jacob and Esau. Now, what are they? They're twins. Who's the older? Esau. Who's the younger? Jacob. Now, watch this, guys. They are twins. The birthright belonged to which one? Esau. That's who it was originally given to. But because he sold his birthright, the birthright was taken from him and given to the younger twin. And his name, Jacob, was changed to what? Israel. Let me ask you a question. Have any of your names been changed to Israel? Anyone in here who's had their name changed to Israel? Wow, I had two hands go up. That's scary. Have any of you had your names changed to Israel? Oh, wow, every hand in this place should be going up. Because when you became a Christian, when you became born again, guess what? You were brought into Israel. You are Abraham's seed. You are spiritual Israel. So let me ask you a question then. If Esau and Jacob were twins, and the birthright was supposed to go to the one that was the eldest, but he rejected that birthright, and so God gives the birthright to the younger who has his name changed to Israel. Do you see there the history between Old Testament Israel and New Testament Israel? Who is the younger? New Testament. Who did the birthright originally go to? Old, but Old Testament Israel sold their birthright, and as a result, God says, I'm giving it to your spiritual, your twin. <laughs> Not literal Israel, but spiritual Israel. Okay? 
So we have the story of Jacob and Esau, and then who is the next main character? Oh, by the way, does Jacob end up going through a time of trouble? <laughs> In these characters, from, from, from Adam all the way up to Joseph, we basically have the entire history, not only of the Old Testament, but of the New Testament church, spiritual Israel, who itself will go through Jacob's time of trouble. Who's the last main character in the book of Genesis? It's Joseph. It's Joseph. The book of Genesis ends with Joseph. So let me tell you a little bit about Joseph. You guys remember what happened with Joseph, right? Joseph was sent ahead to prepare a place for his brothers. Y'all not feeling me. <laughs> Did you catch that? Joseph was sent ahead to prepare a place for his brothers. Now, now remember this. His brothers, by the end of the story, they have to go stand before Joseph. Joseph, Joseph wants to let them into the place he has prepared for them, but before he does that, he has to know if they have changed, so he's about to investigate. Okay. And what Joseph wants to know is very simple. Have you changed? So how's he going to see if he's changed or not? He, he basically wants to know how will they treat who? Benjamin. Now, who is Benjamin? So he was the least of these Joseph's brethren? Oh, no, yeah, I didn't catch him. I'll try it over here. So, so Benjamin was the least of these Joseph's brethren. Is that correct? So Joseph wanted to see, in, or, in order for them to get into the place he had prepared for them, Joseph wanted to see how they would treat the least of these, my brethren. Anyone know what the name Benjamin mean? Son of the right hand. Who is the son of the right hand? Jesus, inasmuch as you have done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. <laughs> How is it, what is the investigative judgment really all about? Beloved, listen to me. It is about how we love one another. And if that's the case, then what God is telling us between these two stories is that God's church is in trouble. We are, we are unprepared for the coming of Christ because we are not yet knowing how to love each other. You see, beloved, what's happening, what happened with, with ancient Israel is that ancient Israel took for granted their position with God. They took for granted the teachings of the Word of God and taking it for granted led them to reject Jesus himself when he came. So, I've set the foundation. Now I need you to follow this very carefully because you need to check this out, guys. So, what are you? When someone, when you're, you know, in a store somewhere and you, got, you get into a conversation with someone or a friend and when you start talking religion and then the person asks, so what are you? What do you say? I am? No, you say, not an Adventist. You say, I am a? Seventh day Adventist. <laughs> right? That's how we respond. And the next thing that comes out of their, their mouth is what? What is that? <laughs> What is that? And what do you proceed to do? You, you proceed to explain to them what? Our, <coughs> our doctrines. Our doctrines. Which is really very interesting because what does a name symbolize in the Bible? Na a name symbolizes one's character. 
one's character. So in other words, to say I am a Seventh-day Adventist should be pointing to character. But the first thing we do is we explain what? Doctrine. Are you, are you catching what I'm saying here? So what are the doctrines we explain? Okay, so we are Seventh-day Adventists, first of all, because we believe in the Sabbath, so seventh day, and then what? Advent means we believe in what? The second coming. So we have the Sabbath, we have the second coming. What else do we have? What else do we teach? Okay, I'm, I'm just talking doctrine now, right? Those peculiar doctrines that we have. We believe Jesus saves, we believe the gospel and all those things, but our particulars, we believe in the Sabbath, we believe in the second coming. What else do we teach? The state of the dead, what else do we teach? The sanctuary, what else? The, the truth about hellfire, the law of God. We teach prophecy, yes? We are supposed to teach prophecy. Some say we're lukewarm. State of the dead, these are all the things. So, so we're going to take a little quiz here. And you might think, oh, well, you know, this is... Why is he asking us these questions? We already know this. Um, so, but I'm going to ask them anyway. Um, by the way, why do we believe, why is our hope in the second coming of Jesus? Salvation. What else? Restoration. Listen, Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. So Jesus said, let not your heart be what? Troubled. Now, why did he say that? Because he knew that trouble would be, would be coming. In fact, does the Bible say that there will be a time of trouble such, such as never was? Yeah? And yet Jesus says, let not your heart be what troubled why why let not your heart be troubled because he's won the war and he is coming again so the second coming of jesus saves us out of the time of trouble amen and that's what we're looking for we're looking for jesus to come again that he could take us away from all this craziness yes yeah okay so tell me what happens when jesus comes again what happens when Jesus comes again? I need you to tell me, uh, um, how do we know what the second coming of Jesus looks like? What happens? The dead in Christ will rise. What else? He comes in the clouds. What else? Every eye sees him. What else? Okay, so it, it's, it's a huge event. You can't miss it. What else? Okay, massive earthquake, uh, again going with a huge event, no one can miss it. Let me just run down a list of things very quickly for you. So he comes with clouds, is that correct? Every eye sees him, is that correct? All right, pause for a second. Every eye sees him. Are you sure? Every eye sees him. Are you sure you're sure? You have no question about that. All right, one more time. If you're sure that every eye sees him, just raise your hand. Okay. You're sure about that? All right. Very good. Very good. <clears throat> the righteous are brought to life when he comes again, yes? The wicked perish. Satan is bound, yes? Uh, he comes with power and glory, amen? And brightness, amen? We are changed in a moment, what? Twinkling of an eye, and we are caught up to heaven. Okay, what's the false version of that? What's it called? Yeah, not just the rapture, the secret rapture and with the secret rapture they believe that when jesus comes again you don't see it right but jesus said every eye will see it so the secret rapture is a false doctrine amen what if i told you that there are adventists that believe in a secret rapture would you believe me Connected with the second coming is the ultimate destruction of the wicked. Yes? Hellfire. And in that teaching, what do we have? What happens in hellfire? 
The wicked are what? Are totally destroyed. You believe that? Amen. Very good. Nothing left of them. Amen? Excellent. Very good. Uh, um, uh, what, about, uh, uh, the, what about the teaching of the state of the dead? What happens to a person when they die? They're asleep. What else? They know nothing. Their love and their hatred and their envy, all those things are perished. Amen? And if the dead claim that they are still alive, then we know that that is spiritual, spiritualism. Amen? Very, very good. Very, very good. Um, the Sabbath. The Sabbath. Why do we keep the Sabbath? Because God rested on the, on the seventh day and blessed it and hallowed it and sanctified it. Amen? Amen. Now, you guys look very bored, and I love this. Because I want you to look very bored. I want you to be like, Pastor, why are you asking us all these questions? We got this. We are Seventh-day Adventists. Test me all you want. <laughs> Good. I, I like your responses right now. Okay, so let's keep going. Uh, 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 the sanctuary. So we teach that unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleanse in prophecy we talk about the uh the 70 week prophecy and the 1260 and the 2300 and we talk about the mark of the beast and the image of the beast this is what makes up the unique features of the adventist church amen so the question is what does it mean to be a seventh day adventist that's the question bible believers and it, it means that we believe in these doctrines do you guys believe in these doctrines? Are you sure? You're sure you're sure. Let's talk about the Sabbath. You see, what it means to keep the Sabbath, what it means to be a seven-day Adventist, is that I am one that keeps the Sabbath. Amen. How many Adventists do we have out there? Amen. Amen. But really, though? Because, listen, beloved, there are two reasons God gave the Sabbath. One was to demonstrate his creative power. God made the world in what? Six days and rested on the, on the seventh. So God created the world six days. He rested on the seventh as a demonstration of his creative power. The Sabbath is a sign that God has the power to create. Amen? But here's the problem. If you're keeping the Sabbath because of what God did thousands of years ago at creation week, you do not yet understand what it means to keep the Sabbath. You're not feeling me. <laughs> because the Sabbath is not just a sign of God's creative power back then. The Sabbath is a sign of God's creative power now. You see, beloved, just as God created the world in six days and rested on the seventh, and therefore Sabbath, so he says, I, if you give your life to me, I will recreate you. So watch this then. A, a, a creation week. R listen carefully. Before you came to God, you were in darkness. And then God said, let there be light. You were baptized by the waters, and you brought forth new fruit. Y'all not feeling me. God, God gave you a new light, a greater light, and a lesser light. And then he calls you to be fishers of men. And he says, listen, I'm going to recreate you in my image and in my likeness. And when he does that, he Sabbaths. Okay. <laughs> Beloved, listen to me. True Sabbath keeping is a sign that God has recreated you. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Because, beloved, you can go to church on Saturday and not be keeping the Sabbath. Because the Sabbath is a sign that God has recreated you. It's not just a sign that he, recreate, that he created the earth thousands of years ago. It's a sign that he has recreated you. Which means when I truly have something, when I truly realize, when, when, when I have truly been recreated in the image of God, the Sabbath is now the reminder of what God did in my life. Amen. 
It is the evidence that God has recreated me. Now watch this. Not only did God give the Sabbath as a sign of his creative power, but if you read the story of Deuteronomy, the Bible says God gave the Sabbath to the Israelites because he had delivered them from captivity. Watch this, guys. The Israelites could not keep the Sabbath while they were in captivity. Y'all are not feeling me. I don't know if you caught that just now. God didn't come to them and say, hey, keep my Sabbath in Egypt. No, he said, I'm going to deliver you out of Egypt, and then you will have something to rejoice about, and that's what it means to keep the Sabbath. Beloved, listen to me. You can't keep the Sabbath while you're in Egypt. If you are still living a life captive to your old ways and your old habits, the house of bondage, it is truly impossible to keep the Sabbath. Why? Because the Sabbath is only a sign of a reality. And if you have not experienced the reality, then the sign is a false sign. Many people, many Seventh-day Adventists are going to church on Sabbath with nothing to celebrate. Are you really a Seventh-day Adventist? (laughs) Has God delivered you from, from something this week, last week, the week before, last month? If God is delivering you, if he has delivered you, then, then the Sabbath becomes a real sign to you. It is evidence of a character change. What does name signify? It signifies character and for many of us we take the sabbath for granted which means our characters are not ready for the coming of jesus speaking of the coming of jesus has jesus come has jesus come has jesus come again no when jesus left the disciples he said I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Then they're like, what are you talking about? And he says, I will send unto you the comforter. I will send unto you the comforter. I will come again. Did he say that? He said that I will come again, and he said I will come again through the comforter. So my question is, Has Jesus come again? (laughs) Beloved, listen to me. In order to be ready for the second coming of Jesus, you must have first experienced the second coming of Jesus. (laughs) Jesus wants to come again in our hearts to prepare us for when he comes again in the sky. Watch this, guys. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Now, you told me that when Jesus comes again, every eye sees him. I know you're thinking, you're thinking like, wait, 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 wait. Listen, when Jesus comes again, does every eye see him? Does anyone have to say, hey, guess what? Jesus has come again. No, every eye sees it and recognizes it for what it is. And in fact, (laughs) if, if someone tells you that he has come, but you can't see him. No, no, no. Beloved, that is a lie. If Jesus has come again, every eye sees it. Hey, man, something's changed about you. Hey, you're different. Hey, hey, what has happened? Why don't you do these things anymore? Why, what has changed? Why do you talk differently? Why do you, why do you look differently? Why do you act 
differently. When Jesus comes again, every eye sees him. And if you're like, well, he's here, but it's a secret, you can't really see it, it is a lie. And the problem is that many Adventists are walking around under secret rapture mode. Yes, he's come, but I can't see him. No, I can't see him. I can't hear him. Nothing. I, well, he's here. Trust me. <laughs> In spirit. In spirit. There you go. In spirit. If he comes... Jesus wants, Jesus is coming again in spirit to prepare you for his coming again in the flesh. Are you with me? Don't get scared. Pastor said Jesus already came. No, 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 no. In fact, here, I did this just to set you up. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, here we go. Let me read this to you very quickly. Uh, where are you? Wow. Okay, I, I will, well, I'll have to find it another time. But Ellen White actually tells us that Christ desires to come again through the Holy Spirit into our hearts, and she's speaking about John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. Jesus himself said it, I will come to you through the Spirit. So, beloved, what I'm saying is this, when Jesus comes again, every eye sees him. When Jesus comes again, he comes with great power and glory. How many of you would like great power and glory? When Jesus comes again, listen, beloved, the, the dead in Christ rise. Y'all not feeling me. <laughs> when he comes again, the dead in Christ rise while the wicked perish. <laughs> How many of you want your old man to perish? When Jesus comes again, the dead in Christ, the righteous man will rise, the wicked man perishes. And we are caught up into heavenly places. Y'all not feeling it? <laughs> Does the Bible tell us that we can now be caught up into heavenly places? Amen. You see, beloved, listen to me. Jesus coming through the Holy Spirit now is like a fire drill for when he comes in reality. Everything that happens when he comes in reality, reality literally is what happens spiritually when he comes by his spirit into our hearts. In fact, when Jesus comes again, Satan is bound. Yeah, I feel it. <laughs> you want Satan bound in your life? When Jesus comes again, beloved, Satan is bound. The, the dead in Christ rise. We are caught up together with Christ into heavenly places. Every eye sees him. And don't forget, we are changed in a moment. <laughs> In the twinkling of an eye, beloved, that is called justification. Have you experienced the coming of Jesus? Because if you have not experienced the coming of Jesus, beloved, you will not be ready when he actually comes again at the second coming. So, not only are we raised up into heavenly places, not only is Satan bound, Beloved, to be a Seventh-day Adventist means that you have experienced the Sabbath and you have experienced the Second Coming. You have experienced, not I believe it, but you have experienced Christ coming into your heart and you have experienced what it means to rest from sin, to rest from captivity, to rest from the house of bondage doesn't stop there what happens when a person dies so the dead know nothing is that right the things that they used to love they no longer love I'm asking you is that right the things that the dead used to love they no longer love and the things they used to hate they no longer hate is that correct they know nothing 
So, beloved, let me ask you something. What happens to the old man when he dies? What should happen to the things he or she once used to love? He no longer loves those things. The things that they used to hate, they no, no longer hate those things. In other words, beloved, when the dead die, the dead know nothing. And if they, if they claim to be alive, it is a form of spiritualism. Otherwise, they never really died. Do you know Ellen White tells us that many people have been baptized but only buried alive? You see, beloved, what I'm trying to tell you is that the doctrines of the Seventh-day Adventist Church are not just doctrines. They were not given to us just so that we could believe, okay, we know what happens to a person when they die, and we know what, the, what day the Sabbath is, and we, all of these doctrines, beloved, listen to me, were designed to change our characters. What about hellfire? What happens to the wicked in the fires of God? <laughs> they are destroyed. How many of you would like to have your old man destroyed by the fires of God? Let me ask you a question. Hellfire, is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's a little bit of both. <laughs> It depends on who you are. <laughs> Hellfire is supposed to be a good thing. Let me tell you why. When I say house fire, what does that mean? The fire is destroying what? The house. Church fire, what does it mean? The fire is destroying the church. Fire. Beloved, listen to me. You know the old man brings hell into our life? Do you know that? The old man brings hell into our life. So, so you know what God's trying to do? <laughs> I'm not going to say it. But he's trying to burn. <laughs> he's trying to burn. <laughs> Um, hell out of you. Y'all not feeling <laughs> God is trying to burn that old man. Burn him with what? With his fire. Many waters cannot quench love. Beloved, the fire of God is the fire of his presence. And through that fire, he desires to burn the old man out of you and turn him into ashes under the soles of your feet. Understand, this is what God is trying to do. The doctrines of the Seventh-day Adventist Church were not just meant to, 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 to make us smarter than others. They were meant to transform our characters. What about the sanctuary? Does the Bible say you are the temple of the Holy Ghost? Let me ask you a question. Where, were, where was sin written? In the where? In the sanctuary. So sin was written in the sanctuary. Or we might say the, the record of sins was recorded in the sanctuary. Is that correct? Let me say it this way. The record of sins was recorded in the temple. Is that correct? Yeah. The record of sin was recorded in the temple. Amen? The record of sin was recorded in the temple. The record of sin was recorded <laughs> in the temple. <laughs> but God wants to cleanse the record of sin by removing it And 
And when he ultimately does that, I love how the spirit of prophecy puts it. She says, the people of God will try to remember their sins, but will not be able to recall them. Beloved, the, the message of God, the, the, the doctrines of the Adventist church are supposed to shape our characters to, be in, to become like God, to become like Christ. <clears throat> and what happens is we separate them from what they should actually do. In other words, we only look at them as, as having to do with how much do you know and do you know more than others and it therefore has no effect upon our characters and as such, we don't know how to treat each other because the doctrines are not doing what they were designed to do in the heart. So that's why we can come to church and believe the truth about the second coming and the Sabbath and the state of the dead and hellfire and the sanctuary and the health message and yet still treat each other like garbage while claiming to love Jesus. And God says, y'all not ready for the judgment. Why? Because you've taken my truth for granted. You've made it all about here and nothing about here. <laughs> Beloved, God's trying to do something in our lives, and I need you to catch this because we talked about what it means to die to self. The dead know how much? Nothing. Have you ever seen um, a person who is just died, maybe in a car accident, and the fire, uh, the fire trucks, ambulance is already there. And what do they usually have covering that dead person? What kind of sheet? White sheet. How many of you would like to be covered in a white sheet? Wow, only five people raised their hands. How many of you would like to be covered in the white sheet? The righteousness of Christ. Yeah. But guys, listen to me. The white sheet is only for the dead. Okay. <laughs> Do you know how scary it would be to walk by and like, oh, the person's dead and the white, the white sheet's covering them, then you see this under the sheet? That would scare you to death, wouldn't it? You want to know why so many people are afraid of the church? Because we claim to be dead to self, but we're moving. A and people are like, wait, I thought you were supposed to be dead. <laughs> I thought you were supposed to be in Christ. How is it that you're acting like this when you're supposed to be in Christ? And so we end up scaring people to death. Beloved, the teachings of our church were meant to change our characters. Let's talk about prophecy. If you have your Bibles with you, I want you to go with me to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. We're going to spend the remainder of, the, of, of our time on prophecy. And I need you to see this very clearly, beloved. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. The Bible says there, and God said, <clears throat> let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. God created man in his what? Image and in his what? Likeness. So what does it mean to be in the likeness of God? His character. You are like him in character. This is how God created man, to be like him in character. And I want you to notice <clears throat> that when God created man, he gave him dominion over something. 
He gave him dominion over the earth and over the sea and over the, uh, over the air, over the fish, of the, the fish of the earth, the fowl of the air, and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. There were two kingdoms here, the kingdom of men and the animal kingdom. And God gave man dominion over the animal kingdom. If you're with me so far, just say amen. <coughs> so God makes man in his image and in his likeness, and under God's rule, man had dominion over the earth and over the animals of the earth. So what happened is that Satan led man to strive for dominion over God. God made everything under man, and now Satan comes along and says, hey, you can become like God. Now, let me ask you, did God make man to be like him? So there's nothing wrong with being like God. But Satan says to Adam and Eve, or to Eve, you can become God. There's a difference. So, so what happens is they end up sinning. And why do they sin? Why does Eve sin? What led, what led her to sin? Who led her to sin? Satan, which came in the form of a, <clears throat> which is an, an animal. <laughs> you guys, God gave man dominion over the animal kingdom. But Satan uses an animal to gain dominion over the human kingdom. Watch this, guys. Follow this. When God comes in the garden, <clears throat> he says, Behold, the man has become as one of us. At least that's what the KJV says. But other versions actually say, Behold the man that was as one of us. In other words, instead of God saying, look, he's not like us, God is saying, look, look at the one who was like one of us. Look what has become of him. That's what God is actually saying. So, so, why is he saying that? Because God made man in his image, but when man sinned, he no longer reflected the image of God. Instead, listen carefully, instead, man began to reflect the image of the beast. Oh, wait. Man first reflected the image of God, but now he sins being led by a beast. And man loses the image of God and now begins to become formed in the image of the beast. <laughs> How do we know this? Let me ask you, when Cain killed his brother, was he acting beastly? Was Cain in, thank you, was Cain in beast mode? <laughs> Cain, everyone. <clears throat> Cain... <clears throat> was in beast mode. Satan led Cain to act in beast mode. And why do we say he was in beast mode? Because he did something beastly. He killed his brother. How many of you remember the story of Nebuchadnezzar as he is walking in his palace and he says, look at this great kingdom that I have built. Pride. And what does God do? He turns Nebuchadnezzar into something like a beast. Why did he do that? Why is he doing that? Why is Nebuchadnezzar now turned into a beast? God is showing us the nature of his heart. Did you catch that? You are acting, Nebuchadnezzar, like a beast. In fact, in fact, <clears throat> this is just so sweet. I mean, so bad, but yet sweet. Well, you get what I mean when I say it. How many of you remember the story of Joseph and his brothers? 
Follow me now, guys. What, does, what do Joseph's brothers do to him? They throw him in a pit. They take his what? His coat. And they sell him into captivity. Now, what do they do with the coat? They dip it in blood. And then what do they do with the coat? <clears throat> they take it to their father. And what do they allow, what do they tell their father? What do they lead their father to believe? Your son was killed by an animal. By animals. By animals. Now they thought they were lying. They thought they were lying. Hey, guys, we've come up with a great lie. But they, what they did not realize is that they were telling the truth. Of course, Joseph wasn't dead, but they were telling the truth. This was done to him by wild animals. The only difference is they were two-legged animals. You ever seen those? Just look around. <laughs> what they did not realize, what they did not know is that they had been changed from the image of God into the image of beasts. Beloved, when we look around at our world today, I'm going to ask you a question. Do you see the image of the beast? You're hearing that for the first time in a way you may never, because if I'd asked that like 20 minutes earlier, you'd be like, yep, I see America. But I'm asking you now, when you look around, when you look at what goes on in our society, when you look at what goes on in our communities, do you see the image of the beast? Now, here's a scary one. When you look around in our churches, do you see the image of the beast? The image of the beast is alive and well in the Seventh-day Adventist church. And that is why, as a church, we are not prepared for the coming of Jesus. We preach against the image of the beast and we warn people about the image of the beast and don't receive the mark of the beast or the name of the, the character of the beast or the number of the beast, not realizing, beloved, that we are in grave danger of doing the very thing ourselves. This is why when we get to the book of Daniel chapter 7, we have God describing the kingdoms of the world by using beasts. What is he saying? The kingdoms of men have become the kingdoms of beasts. Check this out, guys. What does, what does Daniel see in Daniel chapter 7? He sees four beasts and what are those beasts <clears throat> right they represent kingdoms yes but the first beast was what a lion let me ask you what is a lion known for if you had to describe a lion in one word why you would not want to be around a lion <laughs> a lion is fierce ferocious that is the character of the lion ferocious Fierce. Fierce. Do you know any lions? Do you have any lions in your church? Lions, do you understand what I'm saying? Do you know some lions? That second beast was like unto a bear, and the Bible says of that beast, rise and devour much flesh. Devour. You see, beloved, animals devour flesh. Animals devour flesh. Y'all are not. <laughs> animals devour flesh.
That third beast was like a leopard. Let me ask you, what is the distinguishing characteristic of a leopard? It's spots. It's camouflage. You can't see it coming from a distance. It leads you to think one thing when in reality it's something else. It's deceptive. And then that dragon, that fourth beast, also described as devouring and stamping and breaking in pieces. Beloved, listen to me. While those four beasts represent the, 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 the condition of nations, beloved, I believe that they are even showing us the condition of the human heart. Because, beloved, there are many of us who are fierce who devour flesh. I'm, I'm not talking about eating meat. Calm down. <laughs> Do you know what it means to devour flesh? Let me read it to you. In the book of Galatians, the book of Galatians chapter 5, I believe it is. Galatians chapter 5, verse 14. First of all, 1 Peter chapter 5, 8 says this, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring, walketh about, seeking whom he may. What do animals do? They devour. In Galatians 5, 14, the Bible says, For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if you bite and devour one another, animal behavior, guys, beast mode, in the church of God, there is animalistic behavior. Bottom line, we treat each other like animals. We devour, we gossip, we, we talk bad, we, break, we tear down one another's characters. That is animalistic. We drop insinuations and we do what we can to, 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 to gather people against this one and against that one. And beloved, that is beast mode. It doesn't matter if you're in church every Sabbath. If you're in church every Sabbath and yet acting like an animal, you do not know what it means to keep the Sabbath. Can everybody say amen? amen. And you know what? I'm going to say this. You may, be, you may be grudgingly saying amen right now because you're looking at yourself and going, yeah, I'm an animal. And you may not even want to say that to yourself because I'll tell you, many of us who may be in here today, who may be saying amen, you may be treating people like animals in your home church. Yes, I'm talking to you. We have to stop letting these words fly over our head and, you know, yeah, that person, that person, and stop and say, wait a minute, am I engaging in animalistic behavior? Because that's exactly what the brothers did to their brother Joseph. They did not have empathy for their brother. You know, animals, wild animals don't have empathy. Joseph's brothers did not care that they had sold them into slavery. Check this out. Um, did Joseph's brothers care that they sold them into slavery, yes or no? No. So someone had come by later, because remember, one of the characteristics of wild beasts is that they have no empathy. They don't care. They're not moved. So, so could it be that Joseph, maybe a preacher may have come by and maybe tried to talk to the brothers about their brother and they probably wouldn't have cared? We sold him. We wanted to get rid of him. We don't care. So check this out. The brothers of Joseph did not care that they sold him into slavery. They did not care that 
their own came unto them, but that they did not receive them. Did you catch that? Joseph came unto his own, and his own received him not. They didn't care. They were unmoved by the plight of Joseph. How many of us sit through sermons week after week and hear about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, and we're just like, "Mm mm-hmm. See, you might think, well, I'm not a beast because, you know, I'm not mean to people. But, beloved, listen to me. The lack of empathy, the lack of care for what Christ went through for us, that's beast mode. So I want you to think about how many people sit lukewarmly in their pews. Mm -hmm. Christ, aren't we here this week after week after week? Not caring, it might be you. Beloved, I'm trying to show you that God needs us to recognize the mode that we are in. Because once we recognize the mode that we are in, listen to this, guys. Do you know in the book of Revelation, there are three beasts that are described? Can anyone tell me where those beasts are from? One from the sea, one from the earth, and one in the air. No, I'll, I'll wait. In the book of Revelation, there's a beast from the sea, a beast from the earth, a beast from the air. When God created Adam and Eve, he said, let man have dominion. Y'all not feeling me. Let man have dominion over the creatures of the sea and over the creatures of the air and over the creatures of the land. But when man sinned, he no longer reflected the image of God. He had given up his dominion and he no longer had dominion over the beast. And what the, res- the end result of man no longer having dominion over the beast. is that the beasts get out of control. So that by the time you get to the book of Revelation, you have a beast from the sea, which man was supposed to have dominion over, and from the earth, which man was supposed to have dominion over, and the air, which man was supposed to have dominion over, and they have now turned on man and are trying to destroy man. So what does God do? He sends his son. Who, by the way, is the express image of his father? (laughs) Why does he send his son who is the express image of his father? Very simple. Because there's a Bible principle that says, by beholding, do you see what Jesus is trying to do? He's trying to move us from being in the image of beasts to the image of God. Because by beholding the express image of Christ, we become like him. And when we become like him, the order is reversed. Man, once again, has dominion over... (laughs) over the beasts you see beloved listen if we are to overcome the beasts in the book of revelation we must first overcome the beasts in our hearts you want to know who gets the mark of the beast those who have the mark of the beast (laughs) you didn't catch that (laughs) you didn't catch that (laughs) Those who get the mark of the beast will be those who have the mark of the beast. So if you're acting like a beast and if you're devouring one another and if you are gossiping and if you are hating and if you are doing all those things that happen in so many churches that cause so many people heartache, you are prepping yourself to receive the mark of the beast. 
Why? Because you already have the mark of the beast. You get what I'm saying. Don't leave here and say, Pastor said we already have the mark of the beast. Please don't do that. And also, please don't leave here saying, Pastor said that Jesus already came. Please don't do that. For the words of camera, Jesus has not come again the second time, literally. All right? I said it, so you can't. And you do not now have the mark of the beast. Am I looking in the right camera? You do not now have the mark of the beast. You, you, I said it. So don't go and twist my words, please. But beloved, what I'm telling you is this. Satan has his way of prepping you to receive the mark of the beast, and it is by acting like the beast. Beloved, in our churches, we are way too comfortable with beast mode. Let me tell you something. Jesus knew he was coming to a kingdom of beasts. In fact, Jesus was born in a manger. Y'all not feeling me. <laughs> he was born in a manger among animals, almost as if to signify, look, I know who I'm coming to. I know you guys are a bunch of animals, but I have come to redeem you from the image of the beast into the image of my father. What amazing love. What amazing grace to take men who have become like brute beasts and to reform them into the image of God. Beloved, listen to me. There are people who have left our church because they saw the beast. People who have turned their backs on God because they saw the beast. If you have been in this church any amount of time, I can probably guarantee that you have had encounters with the beast. And it's a very frustrating thing, guys. Let me tell you something. When I came into this church 25 years ago, I had a group of friends out in the world. And if you've heard my testimony before, you know we were called the X-Men. That was the name of our crew. And we would, we would do anything for each other. We would die for one another. And, and when I became a Christian, when I became an Adventist, I was like, man, if me and my boys are this close, who are in the world, man, wait till I get into the church. It's going to be like, boom, family. <laughs> Boy, was I wrong. Boy, was I wrong. I still can't really wrap my mind around it. That people in the house of God treat each other the way that they do. I still cannot wrap my mind around it. It's not because I am, you know, holier than thou, whatever, but I just know just being in a worldly experience, being among my people who I said, this is my crew, like we would never do to each other the things, some of the things that we do to each other in the house of God. It would not happen. And I'm telling you, God's church is not ready for the second coming of Jesus for this exact reason. The Bible says in Revelation 12, 11, they overcame him. That is the beast. That is the dragon. That is a serpent. They overcame him by what? The blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. So my question is, what does it mean they overcame him by the blood of the lamb? What does that mean? It means, what do you say? What does it mean? It means to have Jesus? Yes. To recreate us in his image? Yes. Beloved, don't, don't, you know, you're looking nervous right now, like, what does it mean? And maybe that's the problem. Maybe we actually don't know what it means to have the blood of Jesus, to overcome by the blood of Jesus. L -l Let me explain. Um, 
Is there anyone in this room that has my blood? My blood. Okay, there's no one in this room that has my blood. But is there, some, is there anyone in the world that has my blood? Who has my blood? My what? My children? My parents? My siblings? My cousins? My cousins' cousins? They have my blood. So, the fact that they have my blood makes us family. So, so when someone has my blood, guess when, you know, my brothers have my blood. I got three brothers. They have my blood. They have my blood. So I'm just letting you know, don't touch my brothers. <laughs> Did you catch what I just said? Hey, hey, I like you. I love you. Don't touch my brothers, though. Now, now I'm not threatening you like I'll beat you up. I'm just letting you know. Do not touch my brothers. Why? Because that's my blood. Y'all, y'all, <laughs> you're not catching me. That's my blood. Don't touch them. I will lay down my life for them because that's my blood. Now, now, hold on. Uh, uh, if, if I, you ever meet a family member that you didn't know was a family member, but you discovered they were a family member? Like, oh, wow, you're, like, whoa, you are family, you're blood. Yes? You ever had those experiences? Let me ask you a question. Did you have to take time? Did something immediately happen once you found out you were blood? Was it like, you're blood? Okay, what do you need? Yo, we are blood. I was laying on my life. Was it like that? (laughs) Once you know you're blood, that's my family. Is that right? You're scaring me. You're scaring me. (laughs) Whoa, I I were further back than I thought. (laughs) Once you know your blood, it's supposed to be that you're like, that's my blood. That's my cousin. That's my cousin. Cousin, what you need? I want you to know I'm here for you. Even though I just met you at this family reunion, just know that I will go all out for you. Why? Because we're blood. Why are we blood? Oh, because your parents are related to my parents. So that means that you and I have the same blood. So hold on, hold on. What it, what it then means to have the blood of Jesus means I am related to Jesus. That's my Jesus. Mine. Don't talk about him. Don't touch my Jesus. You better respect my Jesus because we're blood. You see, when you're blood, you go all out. Now, hold on a second. Hold on. Wait, 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 wait. Now, I forget your name, but what was your name again? Tina? Tina, you're related to Jesus too? Yeah. What you need? We're, we're family. That's it. We're blood. You're related to Jesus? Yeah. What? Are you sick? Done. Done. We are blood. What do you need, Tina? But here's the problem, beloved. We take the blood of Christ for granted. Because if we really believe that we were family, we would not. We would not be acting like animals. Beloved, God's church is the apple of his eye. Amen. But beloved, the longer, the longer that I, that I am in this blessed church, the more craziness I see, it becomes very discouraging. 
And I can only imagine, if it is discouraging for me, I know you guys look at, oh, that's Pastor Myers, and oh, man, oh, oh. It is discouraging for me to see some of the stuff going on in God's house, to hear some of the stuff, to, 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 and if it's like that for me, I can only imagine what it must be like for you. Especially, you know, you may be tempted to think, oh, Pastor Myers, he's got a mission, he's got a calling, and, and sometimes it's easy for me to fall back on that. Okay, Lord, I'm not going to be discouraged, I'm not going to be this, because you have called me into this church. And sometimes I say, look, if I had known beforehand, <clears throat> like that's why, that's why God doesn't show us the future so often. Because <laughs> If I had seen beforehand some of the crazy ways in which we would treat each other in the house of God, I may have just stayed out of the church and been like, nope. Because if that's what Christianity is about, if that's who the people who claim to be serving God, who claim to be the remnant, if that's what they're about, I don't want any, anything to do with it. And despite all of that, beloved, I am glad where I am right now <laughs> because it's all worth it. Yes, all the craziness is worth it. Don't give up. Look, you may be that beast and you may realize it today, whoa, man, I, I, I know how to go beast mode. And that's discouraging. Lord, change me. What I'm telling you is don't give up. Don't give up. Because at the end of time, God is going to have a people that reflect his image and his character. They will be seventh day Adventists. It will happen. It will come to pass. But beloved, unless we truly understand what it means to be blood, what it means to be family, we're never going to catch it. It was not until Judah, many years later, is standing before Joseph, and he doesn't realize it's Joseph, and he's explaining, listen, let my younger brother go. I will stand in his place. Take me as a bond. It is not until Judah was able to demonstrate that to Joseph that Joseph said, now I know that you are no longer a beast. How many secret conversations are we going to continue to have about our brother, our sister? How many secret meetings? How many secret, how much more backbiting? How much more stabbing? How much more smiling in the face? Oh, hey, brother. It's funny, I, I kind of, <laughs> this is going to be bad to say, but the word brother in our church means nothing. In fact, it is often a sign that something bad is coming. Brother, may I speak to you? Oh, boy. <laughs> Whenever it starts with brother, brother, sister, man, something's bad coming. In the world, when you call someone brother, you meant brother. Bro, brother, sis, what you meant that. In the church, it is an empty term to a large degree because we don't know what it truly means to be family. And Joseph's brothers did not get that picture until much, much, much later. But, beloved, they got the picture. They got the picture. We have to get the picture. We have to get the picture, guys. We have to get the picture. There is no other way around it. Because when we get the picture and behold the picture, did you catch that? 
when we get the picture and behold the picture, by beholding the picture, we become changed into that same picture. We have to get the picture, guys. How long is it going to take for us to stop looking around and start You may have heard me share this before. I'm going to share it again very quickly. We got two minutes and 45 seconds. In the days of Noah, salvation came through a man who was lifted up above the earth on wood. Let me say it again. In the days of Noah, salvation came through a man that was lifted up above the earth on wood. <clears throat> and all men were drawn to him. Yeah. <laughs> but many, for many, it was too late. Listen, in that wood, the ark, <clears throat> there was one window. That's crazy. Because if you and I built an ark today, because we knew a flood was coming, we would want a whole bunch of windows. Why? So we could look out those windows to see who's lost. Wow, there goes Sister Betty right there. She's lost. And look at Brother Jones. Whoa, he's lost. God tells Noah to put a window in the top of the ark. In the midst of the storm, Noah had nowhere to look but up. Beloved, it's time to look up. It's time to stop looking around us, and, and, and it's time to stop. Listen to me, be like, listen, listen. I got one minute, 20 seconds. Let's see if I can do this. Noah, Moses was told to put a serpent upon a pole and lift it up, and those who looked would live. There were people who did not look and did not live. Why? Because they were busy looking at the serpents on the ground trying to save themselves. Beloved, stop looking at the serpents on the ground. Because by beholding, you become changed. And when you're busy looking at, look at that serpent right there, and Sister Betty, she's a serpent, and Brother Jones, he a serpent, and look at Elder, he a serpent. By, by looking at those serpents, you become like what you behold. Look. Up. Keep your eyes focused on Jesus and he will change you from the image of the beast to the image of his father Amen. heavenly father bless us forgive us for our animalistic ways towards one another and teach us what it means to truly have the blood of the lamb in Jesus name we pray Amen and amen.